Okay, in this last part, we're going to talk about um, specific applications and treatment considerations for electrical stem. Of course, we're going to review contraindications and precautions again. But since we've already done it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So the learning objectives, um, number one is the same as it was for the last um, lecture. Um, this uh, Number two, the we want to know what the current is used in the mechanism of iontophoresis for drug delivery. Um, hint, it's direct current. Oh, that's not a hint. I just told you that. Anyway, we'll talk about it. There are four variables which determine the dosage of iontophoresis. You should know those. Um, there are a couple of contraindications and precautions that are specific to ionto, so you should state why ionto might be harmful in those situations. Um, you should be able to choose appropriate outcome measures that clarify changes in function, not simply changes in pain ratings. Because pain ratings are so subjective, um, you really want to um, choose some outcome measures that show that you're um, changing function and not just changing pain ratings. Um, you should be able to state how electrical stim may be integrated with other treatments, modalities, um, or other interventions in a clinical setting and integrate the use of electrical stim for pain control into a comprehensive physical therapy plan of care. So that is really what you have to do for your practical and then every day in the clinic when you get into the clinic. So um, we will uh, practice more on that as well. So the, the practical that will include electrical stim will be the final practical in December. Um, so you'll get lots of time to practice it in lab, and then the final practical will be in December. So um, patient selection, most patients with chronic pain um, demonstrate increased central excitability and diminished central inhibition, with, which augments pain perception. And that includes patients with musculoskeletal and peripheral neuropathic pain syndromes. So TENS targets primarily heightened central excitability and diminished central inhibition. Um, it includes patients with intact central nervous system and tract structures that demonstrate these characteristics. So if you have someone with a spinal cord injury, of course they're going to have different types of pain because they don't have intact um, spinal tracts. So um, adequate amplitude, um, TENS has to be delivered at a strong but tolerable level and it can provide a substantial analgesic effect. TENS delivered at below the sensory threshold level is not going to have the effects that you want. So you have to have that adequate dosage. You want to adjust the TENS amplitude to a strong, comfortable level. Um, permit the uh, patient to habituate to this level for three to five minutes and then continue to increase the amplitude throughout the treatment. So Giving the patient the control of the amplitude is a good thing, but you have to coach them because some people do not want to turn it up. So if it's starting to feel comfortable, they have to turn it up to get the effects that they want. So this is not an unattended e-stim um, application where you put electrodes on someone and give them a, a, a bell and leave the room. You're going to be there for the whole time making the clinical decisions that make the difference between skilled therapy and unskilled therapy. So you should know um, what uh, medications your patient is using. If they're using um, op opioid medications, um, they target mu opioid receptors. Low rate tens activates mu receptors and so if they are using opioids and they have a tolerance, you need to select high frequency TENS to optimize the analgesic effects. Otherwise, select a frequency range that's well tolerated by the patient and permits an adequate um, stimulus to be applied. Um, individual treatments need to be a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes to observe analgesic effects in patients with chronic pain in the knees from osteoarthritis. Um, cumulative reduction in chronic low back pain when repeated applications of TENS at least two times a week was applied, were um, shown in study in number 19. Um, it's hypothesized that TENS may normalize the nervous system's response to chronic pain by reducing the peripheral nervous system or central nervous system sensitization and or by restoring the descending inhibition with repeated use. 
So that's pretty cool. If you have repeated or long-term use, you can actually normalize your nervous system and turn down those pain responses. Um, repeated use may also enable a patient to tolerate progressively increasing intensity of TENS and thus realize an adequate dose-response relationship. So TENS usage, uh, usage over six or more months results in decreased pain with activities, increased activity levels, and decreased use of pain medication. That seems pretty successful if you ask me. So all the studies that's, that state these things are um, listed in the references at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, when you use pain during activities, it's considered to be evoked pain because you're evoking pain with an activity. So the greatest analgesic effects of TENS are observed during activities or tests that evoke pain when compared to effects of pain at rest. So if you're using the TENS unit um, lying on ice, um, you're going to actually have a better effect if you do it while you're doing the laundry or doing some other activity that evokes pain. So um, when you apply TENS during functional activities or exercises that are associated with discomfort, you get better effects than doing it at rest. Um, applying it judici judiciously during um, other therapeutic interventions that might be uncomfortable, like manual therapy or tissue stretching or range of motion, might be helpful. So um, iontophoresis is the use of low amplitude direct current to facilitate transdermal drug delivery. The reason we use direct current is we want that polarity because it's based on the principle that like charges repel. So it's most commonly used in rehabilitation to apply dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory uh, corticosteroid. Um, the drug penetrates a few millimeters into the um, body. So you have to know where your target tissues are. Um, it's really useful on places like the elbow in this picture or on the foot or ankle because it only needs to go in a few millimeters. Using it on your low back, it might not be all that effective. So the dosage, um, you need to, there are really four different current amplitudes that you're going to use with um, your standard iontophoresis machine. And it's going to depend on what the patient can tolerate. If they can only tolerate one um, microamp, it's going to take 40 minutes to um, give, do them the treatment. If they can tolerate two, it'll take 20 minutes. You can read the chart. So if you can turn up the amplitude more, you can um, uh, introduce the medication in a shorter amount of time. There's also these low um, voltage iontophoresis devices um, that you apply and you leave on for 24 hours. I had another picture um, in one of the previous um, slides. These ones have a little um, unit that attaches to it. The other one, it looks like a big band-aid. It actually looks like this um, one on the right um, without the little um, electrical unit attached to it. Once you take off the adhesive, it activates the battery and you just have you apply it to the patient and you have them leave it on for 24 hours so as long as they don't have any contraindications it should be okay if they do have any reactions you want to make sure they monitor those reactions so you want to educate them about that um, the parameters of um, iontophoresis are going to be the electrode placement and size you want the active electrode over the area of inflammation um, you want the size adequate so the current density doesn't exceed uh, 0.5 milliamps per centimeter squared and you want the polarity to be the same as the active ion of the drug. On the, on the opposite electrode you put normal saline. Um, so on the active electrode you put the drug and on the opposite electrode you put normal saline. Um, we will practice in lab and we'll use saline for both electrodes. So the contraindications and precautions for all electrical stimulation also apply to ionto, but it has some additional um, things to think about. Ionto should not be applied after the application of any physical agent that may alter skin permeability. So heat, ice, ultrasound, they may alter, um, alter the permeability of skin and cells, and so it's going to change how the drug is delivered. 
You need to pay attention to contraindications for the individual drug. Most of the time we're using dexamethasone. There are other drugs, and they're listed in the book, um, that you might use um, iontophoresis with. When um, at the clinic where I work, it's a hospital-based outpatient clinic, and so before we apply um, iontophoresis to someone, we have to have a prescription from the doctor. We have to have the pharmacy review the person's allergy history and make sure that they don't have any contraindications to that drug. So um, once they've done it, then we have the medication, we can apply it to them. So as far as outcome measures go, you want to apply outcome measures that assess pain during activities compared to pain at rest because um, we want to improve function, not just improve pain levels, because that it's pretty subjective. So the timed up and go has been used. Um, that's really useful. Um, you have someone sit in a chair. You have a um, cone or a marker three meters away from them or 10 feet away from them. Um, you start the timer. They stand up, walk around the cone, and sit back down. Um, the six-minute walk test, which is shown in this picture, they're basically walking back and forth for six minutes, and you measure the distance they can walk, and you're also um, assessing their pain during this activity. Um, you, you do see there are studies that show improvements in pain in uh, patients with postoperative pain with movement after electrical stim and improved function in patients with fibromyalgia. So you want to assess the outcomes at the time of the expected optimal effects. So while the TENS is activated or immediately and shortly post-treatment. But you also want to assess outcomes after short-term treatment, so after a month of usage. Um, you want to assess them after long-term treatment or um, after six months with or without treatment. So did you have ongoing cumulative lasting effects? Um, so you're, you're reassessing your outcome measures. Um, we do it, in my clinic, we do it every 10th visit and at, the, and at discharge. And, of course, um, we don't always do a timed up and go after every time we do an intervention, um, but we're going to assess it fairly frequently. Um, so treatment summary, you're going to select the appropriate client and identify the indications for um, electrical stim for pain management. You're going to consider contraindications um, and adjust for precautions as needed. You're going to educate the client uh, regarding the procedure and its integration into their plan of care. Where are we going with this? Um, I have worked in clinics where people got e-stim from the day they walked in till the day they walked out. Um, generally, we don't do that in my clinic, um, but... Um, you want to tell the patient where we're going with this. It's not just random. Um, you want to set up some expectations of them monitoring their symptoms after the treatment so they can tell you about it the next time. Um, you want to establish active functional outcome measures related to electrical stim treatment and do pre-treatment assessment. Um, you want to adequately prepare the skin for treatment. You want to cleanse the skin and clip the hair as needed. Um, you are going to select and apply the correct electrodes, and you're going to record the electrode placement in your chart. You're going to select the stimulus mode, so you're going to consider pain medications and select the mode accordingly. If someone's on opioid pain medications, you're going to use um, high rate. If they're, on, if they're not, then you might use the low rate. Um, you're going to adjust stimulus patterns, frequency, and pulse duration. You're going to advance the amplitude for each channel separately, or you're going to permit the client to advance the amplitude. Um, you're going to adjust the stimulation to a strong but tolerable, tolerable sensory stimulus or a motor threshold stimulus if you're using low rate. Um, you're going to monitor the client's response during treatment, and you're going to adjust for habituation by increasing the amplitude every three to five minutes to achieve adequate dose response. During and after the treatment, you're, you're going to treat for at least 30 minutes initially, monitoring the client's response, including pain intensity at rest, vital signs, posture, response to activities, or evoked pain. So you might be doing the electrical stim treatment during exercise or do, during other activities in therapy. 
Um, so the client may participate in activity during the treatment, but they have to be um, take care not to cause injury if their pain response is masked by electrical stim. So when they're, you're at end range of motion or you're doing manual therapy. Following treatment, you're going to remove the electrodes and inspect the skin, and you're going to note, as in write in your documentation, any skin irritation, um, and whether it was from an electrode or gel or tape. It never hurts to take a picture of it. A picture paints a thousand words, right? Um, pain and functional participation responses should be evaluated pre-treatment, during treatment, immediately post-treatment, and for carryover, 8 to 24 hours following treatment. So either you can call the patient and follow up, or you can tell them 8 to 24 hours from now, I want you to write down how you're feeling about how your pain is and what your function is like, that sort of thing. Post-treatment, the client can maintain an activity log to assess functional outcomes over time, and they can also maintain a pain log. Um, parameters or electrode placements may be adjusted during treatment, but should be left intact for a period of time um, adequate to evaluate the effectiveness of that particular setup. So sometimes you're trying to do a sensory level um, electrode setup and you're getting a motor response. Sometimes what you have to do is you have to shut off the machine, move the electrode so it's not on a motor point, and, and start over. So um, you're gonna, uh, you may be adjusting it a little bit, but once you've settled on your settings, um, you want to leave it there for a long enough time so you can evaluate the effectiveness. So if you're using TENS in a home program, um, it may be a time-dependent rather than a pain-dependent use of TENS. In other words, you're going to tell the patient, I want you to use it for X number of minutes every like say I'm, I want you to use it for 30 minutes every three hours. I'm just giving that as an example. Um, especially for patients who demonstrate um, behaviors characteristic of chronic pain. So pre-programmed protocols. There are a lot of machines that have so, so anybody could just walk up, slap electrodes on someone, hit one of the pre-programmed buttons. But really if you're using electrical stim for pain management, it requires the skin Skilled clinical decision making commensurate with the role of the therapist. It is not appropriate to turn the application of electrical stim for pain management into a non-skilled treatment that may be performed in an ongoing manner by support personnel. So it's especially not appropriate for the initial application of e-stim for pain management or other applications because you really want to monitor your patient's response. Um, it's useful to um, facilitate clinical efficiency or client independence in treatment during appointments or for home treatment. Once you have figured out the optimal stimulation settings, you the PT or the PTA has assessed that and figured out the optimal settings, and then you can turn it over to support personnel or the individual client or patient to do at home. But don't skip the step of figuring out the optimal stimulation settings. You really need to assess that, and that is a skilled clinical decision-making process. Oh my God, you have just survived your last eSTEM lecture. There's a list of references at the end of the PowerPoint that refer to all those studies that I talked about, and we're going to practice this so much in lab.